Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous few le uh, video lectures for this series, we've talked primarily about only one partial differential equation, and that's the heat equation. Now, we use the heat equation to better understand partial differential equations as a whole. We talked about things like initial and boundary conditions. We eventually started talking about Fourier series and the convergence of those things, what it means to have appropriate initial conditions that are describing these Fourier series. But what we would like to do now is actually expand our scope a little bit. We'd like to talk about different partial differential equations. And so in this lecture, we're going to begin an examination of another very famous PDE called the wave equation. Now you're going to see it's very closely related to the heat equation. Again, we're going to have that Laplacian operator, that second order derivative. But now we're also going to have a second order and time derivative. Now what I'd like to do in this video is actually derive the equation. Same thing we did with the heat equation. We're going to derive it from fundamental principles, in this case uh, things like Newton's law, so sort of basic physical principles. And we're going to build ourselves up and we're going to see sort of where this comes from. We're also going to see what kind of assumptions are, have to be made in order to make this uh, something that we can work with. So in particular what we're going to look at is the description of, say, a vibrating string. Okay, So you have sort of two endpoints, you have a finite string, let's say this is x equal to 0, this is x equal to l, so this is similar to what we talked about with the heat equation, we have a rod of length l, here we have a string of length l, and we're going to describe its displacement. So we're going to talk about this sort of up and down motion, this is going to be u of x comma t, okay? So this is the displacement at point x at point or at time t. Now, the sort of easiest application of this is musical strings, right? So if you play a stringed instrument, maybe guitar or something like that, this is really what we're going to see when we start solving this is we can figure out what kind of sounds will come out of things just by solving this wave equation. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to derive this equation. The first thing that we'll do is we'll start with a small segment of the string, just like we did with the uh, rod. We're going to look at uh, between x and x plus delta x. So that means that we have just a small little portion of the string delta x. And we're going to assume it's really, really small because we're going to assume that if we have a mass density, so that is the mass density of the string, I'm going to call it rho of x, so maybe the string doesn't necessarily have to have uniform density. It could be, you know, uh, sort of varying over the length of the string. What this would mean is that the string mass, so the string mass in the segment, and what I mean by the segment here is between x and x plus delta x, is well, approximately rho of x times delta x. And this is the same assumption that we made when we looked at the heat equation. We just assumed that delta x is so small that this thing hardly changes over the entire, or over the segment here. So we can just approximate the string mass uh, in this segment by rho of x delta x. Now, we are going to assume a few things, okay? The first thing is we're going to assume that our string is perfectly flexible, okay? So what that means is that the more I bend it, uh, I'm not going to increase the force on this thing, okay? So it's not like a, if you ever take a, a really, really hard spring and try and bend it, the more you bend it, you can feel it sort of pulling back on you. We're going to assume that our string doesn't have that property, okay? So we call that a perfectly a uh, flexible string. Now, what we're also going to talk about is the tension on the string. So again, here if I sort of zoom in on my little segment, and here's my just chunk of string. Let's say it's just a, a small little chunk between x and x plus delta x. Then the tensile force is going to be tangent to the string at that at point at any point in the string. So in my case, x. So this is the tensile force, capital T. So capital T equals to the string tension. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce an angle 
that describes the bend of the string at each point, okay? So we're going to assume that the string would, you know, if there was no uh, initial disturbance on the string, it would just be a nice straight string. And that nice straight string would have angle zero at every single point. And then if you imagine you sort of wiggle the string, maybe you pull it and you let it sort of vibrate or whatever it is, at each point in space and time, you can describe the angle that that thing makes. This is the angle of displacement, okay? So theta here is gonna be the angle uh, between, so between B, T, W, N for me, uh, the horizontal, right? So the horizontal and the string. Now, in this case, what you can get is that the slope of your, of your, uh, uh, of your tensile force, your tangent here, well, the slope can be described in terms of that uh, angle, right? This is just tan of theta x comma t, right? So sort of just basic trigonometry. But also, remember, if u of x comma t is the displacement of this thing, again, the tension here, this is a tangent vector. Whenever we think of tangent vectors, we think of derivatives. So this slope is also just the partial derivative of the displacement with respect to x. And the reason it's in x is because we are sort of moving in the x direction, right? So there's no, uh, the time here is sort of held fixed. Okay, so now let's put this together using my personal favorite physical law. Why is it my personal favorite? Uh, because it's the easiest one to use and it's used so much across physics. But Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration here. Well, let's do mass times acceleration first. What's the mass? So rho of x times delta x. The acceleration here at any point, this is acceleration in time. So that's a second order time derivative. Here we see the, the first difference with the, the heat equation because the heat equation only had one time derivative in it. So this is mass times acceleration. And this has to be equal to the forces that are acting on my string. Well, the first force, uh, the forces that are acting on this thing are going to be the tensile force from one end. So this is the tensile force at x plus delta x comma t. But the tensile force here has to be just acting in the direction of the vertical displacement. So we've got to do a little bit of trigonometry here. So this is theta of x plus delta x comma t. Right, so that's why we have this angle. Again, it's just a nice little Soka Toa thing. And then subtracting off the tensile force at the other end of this thing. So this is sort of total tensile force at one end minus the other end. And then sine, again, theta x comma t. Very similar to what we did with the, with the heated rod. And then what we're going to do is we're also going to add in one more force, which could be an external body force, okay? So in my case, this would be sort of the mass of the spring and then multiplied by, again, just to keep uh, notation consistent with the heat equation, we'll call this Q of X of T. So this is just any sort of external body force that could be acting on the string. So for example, it could be gravity, right? Maybe the string is really sort of flimsy and, and floppy and sort of you can imagine gravity really pulling that thing down, right? But there's all kinds of different forces that you could imagine acting on this thing. But okay, now we're gonna play the same game that we did with the heat equation. We can divide off the delta x's and let delta x go to zero. That means that once you divide this thing, you're just gonna get a nice derivative. Same thing as the heat equation, so letting let's say letting delta x go to zero. Well, what will this give me? So I get rho of x, second order in time, 
and then this is equal to, and now I've got a partial derivative in x of t of x comma t sine of theta x, uh, sorry, comma t. And then, sorry, plus rho of x q of x comma t, right? So the delta x here canceled, so we didn't have to worry about taking that limit. Now, the question is, how do we sort of simplify some of these things? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make an assumption. So assume that my displacement angles are relatively small, okay? So this isn't some big elastic cable that I can really pull up and go, wow, right? This is, again, think about a guitar string, right? You even whenever you pluck the guitar string, you hardly even see the displacement, right? It's just a tiny little vibration that's taking place in there. And that would mean that these angles in here are very, very, very small. They are close to zero. You know, even if they're rapidly oscillating, even if, even if you pluck it uh, very, very hard, it's still a relatively small angle. So I'm going to make the assumption that is consistent with reality that we have very small angular displacement here. And what this means is if I take this formula down here, I can do a little simplification. I get tan of theta, right? That's just this formula. I just left out the x and t because it's just a pain to write. Remember what theta is though, it's, or sorry, what the tangent is, it's sine over cos. But if theta is close to zero, cos is basically just one, right? Which means that this thing is basically just a sine Right, so the, this here is basically just the sign, but the beauty of this is now I can replace this term right here. So again, there's a simplification here. There's an assumption that we've made. And so what we get is the most general form of what's called the wave equation, okay? So it's a wave because it's describing this sort of wiggling, this vibrating wave motion of our, um, of our of vibrating string. So here I get rho of x, second order in time equation. That's really the major difference from the heat equation. And it has profound effects on the dynamics of the equation. So the solutions. Here now we get a tensile force. And then replacing this sign in here with a partial derivative. Again, go back and look at the heat equation. You'll notice that it's very, very similar rho of x, q of x comma t. That is the heat, or sorry, the wave equation in its most general form. But of course, you know, just like we did with the heat equation, we want to sort of narrow this down. We want to make it simpler for ourselves. We've got to start from the bottom and work our way up. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at a perfectly, perfectly elastic string. And what this really means is that we are assuming that our tension is just constant, okay? So most real strings are, are actually like this. It's just saying that it's a sort of uniform material across this thing and to, to sort of stretch or to apply some sort of force to this thing, uh, this string is the same at every point in space and time. And it's not a huge assumption, right? This is, this is something that most people... Uh, would make on their strings unless you are like an engineer really designing some sort of material to achieve a certain kind of uh, um, uh, outcome. Now, the other thing is um, in the 1D wave equation, right? So this is 1D because it's one spatial dimension. It's also only one time dimension. Um, mostly, our external body force, just like I said, is mostly just gravity, okay? So, you know, unlike the, the heat equation where this could be some sort of external uh, temperature gradient that's being sort of forced into the equation, most of the time when it comes to the, to the wave equation, the external forcing here is really just gravity. Now, again, think about the, um, the, the guitar string or whatever your favorite stringed instrument is. Mine's the guitar, so I'm going to use the guitar a lot. 
gravity doesn't really seem to be playing a huge role in this thing, right? If I, if I pluck a guitar string, it's sort of vibrating. You don't see it sagging due to gravity, right? It doesn't feel like gravity is having a huge effect on this thing. And so that's because a lot of the time this can be neglected, okay? So most of the time, most of the dynamics of the heat equation are being driven by the tensile forces, right? This sort of movement right here, the, the actual plucking of the guitar string. And so that means that uh, in general, so but, typically you're gonna get something that looks like this. You're gonna have this forcing right here, so this rho of x times q, which is just the gravity, usually this is really small, much smaller, right? Two inequalities here, it means much smaller, that's how you'd say it in English. It's much smaller than the tensile force. And so we neglect it, okay? We typically don't include this gravitational force. And what that means is that you know, with these two sort of really fundamental, simple assumptions, right? Guitar strings, they satisfy this. Um, this would give us the sort of more prototypical version of the, um, of the wave equation. Okay, so here really all that matters is the density on this thing, of the, of the string. And of course, the density does matter. Again, if you play a stringed instrument, you'll know that you can get all kinds of different strings. If you play a classical guitar, these are nylon strings. They're very, very fine. As it, or if you play an electric guitar, it's usually nickel or copper plated, plated strings. So that the, um, the density will be very different among these different kinds of strings. However, even though the density can be different among different strings, most of the time the string is made of a uniform material. So again, we can also assume that rho of x is just constant, right? So this is the same thing that we did with the heat equation. We just assumed that the rod was, was some sort of constant material. You can, of course, design rods that on one side might be copper and the other side might be nickel or whatever it happens to be. You could also des design strings in this way as well. But in most situations, or at least the easiest ones, the string is a uniform, uh, it's, it has a uniform density because it's made of the same material all the way across. And what this really gives you is the true version of the, he, uh, of the wave equation that we're gonna work with, okay? So here, let's just finish this off. Here's the wave equation. Okay, if I divide off a constant row here, I get second order derivative in time is equal to, I'm gonna use this standard notation, c squared times the second order derivative in space. That right there is what people typically refer to as the wave equation. In this case, c squared is given by the, the constant tensile force divided by the constant um, uh, density, okay? I use c squared because it's gonna be important whenever I start coming up with uh, doing separation of variables. We're gonna work with uh, just c Right? So we're either gonna have to take a square root or we can, we can artificially put the square on there so we don't have to keep taking square roots and make things messy. But this is the equation that we're gonna work with. This is the wave equation. In the next video when we come back, we're gonna look at boundary conditions on these string, or uh, yeah, on these string systems or these wave equations. And we're gonna talk about you know, what they would look like, how they're similar to the heat equation. And once we get those boundary conditions, then we can solve this thing using separation of variables. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.